As we embark on this message, I invite you to join me in prayer. Father God, Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, God, thank you for your presence here, for your presence in our life, for all that you do. Uh, and God, today as we are here for this message, uh, I just ask that you would speak the words you want, that we would be able to hear individually what you have prepared for each one. God, it is a blessing to know that you love and care and have uh, the message for us. We thank you for sharing. In Christ's name, amen. Forever. What does forever mean? Is that a fixed time? This is going to last forever and then it's no longer there? Or does forever just keep going? One of those kind of things we wonder about as we go, is God's mercy forever? Or does it go to a point and then what's next? As part of those in the church of Rome, and this is a continuation of what we've been going through in Romans, of Paul's dialoguing of the Jewish church and the Gentile church in Rome. And this is a continuing part of that uh, story. But as a part of those in the church of Rome assumed that God's mercy had run out for some, but he was still in effect for others. Why would they do that? Why would they think his mercy ended? But yet it had some effect on others. Today's text, as we heard, was Romans 11, 1 through 2, and then 11, 29 through 32. I'm going to read through sections of that. It's a different translation. I'm using God's Word translation today, or Common English Bible. So I ask you, verse 11, or verse 1 from chapter 11, has God rejected his people? Absolutely not. And this is Paul. I am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God hasn't rejected his people whom he knew in advance. Or don't you know what the scripture says in the case of Elijah when he pleads with God against Israel? Paul starts out this section with the question, has God rejected his people? I would venture to guess that you may have visited with somebody somewhere along in your life that they have told you God has rejected them because of circumstances. Hopefully you didn't agree. Some of the Gentiles assumed that since the gospel had come to them, that meant God had rejected the Jews. So it was us and them, or them and us, and we couldn't both, in their mind, have the same blessing. But Paul is about that concept as we go through this. You know, th th here's the question. Some of the Gentiles assumed that the gospel had come to them. That meant God had rejected the Jews. If you go back into the original Greek, Paul's answer was, a whole lot more than an emphatic no. It was screaming, yelling. The intensity of that script was, you're missing the boat. That is false. Don't go down that road. I mean, there's a whole series of this that Paul is saying, uh-uh, it's not them and you or us and them. If we read it as we have just done in today's or the more modern uh, translations, it loses a lot of the forcefulness. But it was a very much, Paul's answer was an emphatic no. The very idea to, to Paul was ludicrous. It, it didn't make sense to him. He knew what God was about. 
And he trusted that. And for anybody to deviate from that, it was ludicrous. He did not get it. So that's part of what he's going to be addressing. How dare anyone suggest such a thing? So if you hear of someone talking along those lines, don't buy in. Recognize what God has done in your life and what he's doing in everyone's life, regardless of the circumstances that you see. There is, should be a, this, this underlying trust that God will do what he says. And then Paul uses himself to prove this point. He is a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. He was a persecutor of the church. We've read that many times where he imprisoned members, put members uh, to death. So he was very much against those in the church. But God chose to show mercy to Paul. God gave him the great honor of bringing many people to faith in Christ. Now, just think about this. If you had a family member or you were aware of a friend, a neighbor that Paul had persecuted, and they're no longer there, and Paul comes back on the scene, and he's preaching Christ. Are you readily going to jump on that bandwagon with him? Are you going to sit down and say, tell me more? I want to hear more. Or is there going to be that stigma that he took my neighbor out? He took my friends out. So Paul, in his defense, as he is laying himself out, I am Jew. Israelite, from the tribe of Benjamin, and I persecuted the church. If there's somebody that's really messed up, it's me. But God gave him the great honor of bringing many people to faith in Christ. If God had wanted to stop showing mercy to the Jewish people, Paul would have been a good candidate. I mean, you think about it. If, if God's going to say... Ah, you, you messed up too much. I can't do this anymore for you. Paul would have been right there at the top of the list in a sense because of what his background and how he lived his life. Throughout the Old Testament, the Jewish people repeatedly turned away from the covenant that God had made for them. And we can read that story from Genesis through Malachi. They would go to a prophet and they would reject. It was just a series of yes, no, yes, no. Each time God spoke through a prophet reminding them that he would not break his everlasting unconditional covenant for them. Let's, let's think about those words. Everlasting. That's forever. There is no end game. It's everlasting. Unconditional. Okay, there's no conditions. This was put in play for all. A covenant agreement with them. This was for you. God would remind them through that prophet. And that would go along for a while, and then the people would reject or kill the prophet, and God would do it all over again. But he kept doing that. He would continue to show to them mercy. That's what God, if you read through the Old Testament, clear on through the rest of the Bible, God's mercy is a constant. It continues. You don't have to have these do's and don'ts, do's and don'ts to the point that you can't get it done. God is there. He loves and he provides. We can do all the things we have done 
wrong. Think about your life. Can you think of some things that you might have done wrong? Might have, might have made a mistake? Maybe rejected God? Maybe not agreed with God? Challenged God? That's all a part of our life. And God is big enough to withstand all of that. He knows each one of us. We think of the, Paul's narrative of he did what he didn't want to do, and what he wanted to do, he didn't do. That's kind of the mantra that follows my life. I, I find myself in that a lot. And I, I dare say I'm not the only one. It's a part of our human existence. In all our mistakes, in all of our sins, we can know that there is one who continually shows mercy. That's a, that's a constant. That is something we can hang on to. That is something that when we recognize that we've made a mistake, that we've made a choice that wasn't the best, we can go back. We can go right to God and know that that mercy is there. It never ends. The forever word really works well in that. God has not given up on you, nor will he do so. Have you thought about, or have you ever been in a situation where you, you really feel like God said, you crossed the line. I can't go there. There are a lot of people in this world that will tell you that. That they, that God gave up on them because they gave up on him. There are people that will tell you that. You might give up on God, but he will never give up on you. That is, that is again, a constant. His mercy endures forever. In verse 29, as we jump through the, to this section, and that if you have time at home, you can read that section between verse 3 and verse 28. And it is a, a narrative of Paul referring to the Jews and the Gentiles, and the Jews and the Gentiles. And there is a back and forth as you go through that section. And if you have time, you might want to read that. But in verse 29, God's gifts and calling cannot be taken back. Once God says something, it's done. It's said. In the verses between 2 and 29, that's what he's talking about, Paul makes his case that although many Jews have rejected Jesus, he has not rejected them. But he also extended his invitation to the Gentiles. Paul's conclusions are that God's gifts and calling are irrevocable. What does irrevocable mean? They don't change. They don't go back. They move forward, and it is a constant. It is a promise. It's not possible to repeal or cancel. When, in, when God makes something irrevocable, it's constant. The promise made to Abraham in Genesis 12 to be a blessing to all people has never been revoked. You think about that. That promise that... God made to Abraham, this is true today as it was then. The fulfillment of that blessing actually came through the accomplishment of Jesus in his life. We have that contact with God. That promise that was made to Abraham, we are recipients of that. If God has not given up on his people, Israel, then he will certainly not give up on us either. That's something we can hang on to. That's something that 
But when things really get tough and we're struggling, we know God has not forgotten us. It may feel like it. You may even challenge or re refer and say, God, you forgot about me. I'm here. No, he hasn't. And he will answer. Even in knowing that God will continue to show us mercy, do we sometimes think we've messed up so bad that God will forget about us? I've had that conversation with people. And it's wrong. It's false. Yeah, we all make mistakes. We're human. We live in a broken world and we're a broken people. And we will mess up. God knew that. He sent Jesus to redeem, to pay that for us. We don't have to. We are loved by him. God is the God of infinite chances. We don't get 747 chances or 1320 chances. We get as many chances as it takes forever. There's not a numerical number that says, you're getting close. You know, you maybe only have three left. Use them wise. No, it's not that way. It's never ending. God will never abandon you nor give up on you. If you walk away today with nothing else, take that and put it in your heart. Live the reality of God never will abandon me. His mercy endures forever. Back to that forever. There is no end. Once, in verse 30, you were disobedient to God, but now you have mercy because they were disobedient. Again, he's comparing and contrasting Jews and Gentiles. Jews fell short. Gentiles received. Oh, we received, so that means you didn't know. They both received. In verse 31, in the same way, they have also been disobedient because of the mercy that you received, Jews and Gentiles. So now they can receive mercy too. It applies everywhere. God has locked up all people in disobedient in order to have mercy on all of them. What does all mean? All means all. Paul is explaining that God's mercy extends to all people. Paul's point is that God's mercy is not limited to any one group of people. Race, gender, vocation, age. God's mercy is not limited. God's mercy is for all regardless of their background or past behavior or who they are. As I was listening and, and studying and thinking about this, Jesus came and made the way for all humanity. And immediately someone might say, well, what about someone like a Hitler? or a Genghis Khan that was horribly destructive to humanity. Did Jesus' sacrifice apply to them? Many people would say no, with an emphatic no. But he did. Jesus didn't draw lines and say, okay, if you live this way, you're in. 
And if you didn't, you're out. Or if you were in this people group, you're in. But this people group doesn't get it. Does that mean that every person says, yes, Jesus, I, I recognize you in my life. I want you in my life. Not so much. That probably is part of the future that is still coming. For someone to live in that realm and knowingly reject is a whole different realm. But the first part of that is Jesus saved you. It's your choice if you accept that. God's mercy is for all. You think about that. When it comes to mercy, God does not play favorites. That in itself is a huge comfort to me. I'm not the best person out there, nor am I the worst person. But I'm a child of God, loved by him. His design has always been to show mercy to all. And there are people that, because of some heinous crime or heinous thing that was put on them, refuse mercy. And that hurts. Because in reality, Jesus took it all on him. And the slate was cleaned because Jesus took the price. And that mercy is available to everyone. Will we all receive it at the same time? No. Are there people that have lived and died on this earth that never heard the name of Jesus? Yes. Well, how does that work? I don't know. It's not my, my preview to know that. But I believe if Jesus came for all, he didn't limit it to a select group. Christ's concern, concern is not which side of the battle lines you're on, what tribe you are a part of, or where your political leanings lie. That isn't important to Jesus. His design has always been to show mercy to all. Jesus saved us all, no exceptions. You know, you, you think of someone that was born with a mental disorder, and they can't understand the concept of Jesus. They don't, they, it doesn't even equate because they can't humanly, in their mind, work it out. That doesn't mean that Jesus rejected them. He died for them too. His design has always been to show mercy. It's our choice to believe the reality that we are saved. It's our choice. We have to look at that. Let us receive his mercy today. And let us extend his mercy towards others. And for some, which side of that coin is the harder? Receiving mercy, knowing who we are, or extending mercy to others, knowing who they are? Let us put that in the hands and arms of Jesus as he lives in us because his mercy endures forever. Forever means what? It doesn't end. It goes and it goes and it goes forever. As we come to this part of the service, we'll read 1 Corinthians 
chapter 10, verses 16 through 17. Isn't the cup of blessing that we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Isn't the loaf of bread that we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Since there is one loaf of bread, we who are many are one body, because we all share the one loaf of bread. Taking the message today, we all share in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and the mercy that we have, the savings grace that we have from his life, death, ascension, resurrection, all of those components give us a future. And that future, again, is forever. The table in Grace Communion is available to all. It's your choice to come if you choose. The fruit of the vine and the bread are at the table. And it's something we can reflect on and know that that mercy that we receive every day is from Jesus. You bow your heads, please. Most loving, merciful God, Father, Son, and Spirit, let us focus on you and forever you how you have come and provided everything for us in the midst of change, in the midst of uh, our daily lives, there are challenges and God, we acknowledge that we don't always handle those the best, but God, we thank you that you are there and we can come to you and you will answer. I ask that you would bless the elements at the table, the fruit of the vine and the bread, as they represent Jesus' broken body and his spilled blood, again, for us. God, we look, we look so forward to the future when we will live with you in your kingdom. God, I just ask that you would bless each one of us as we reflect on and embark on the activity of uh, this communion, of relationships with others, and of the life struggle that we can just give it to you and trust. In Jesus' name, amen.